Hello and welcome back to the port. I'm the Gallup Major and this is a test video on the idea of possibly including a little bit more history on our channel in regards to the ships that we play. Now for this example I'm going to cover HMS Exeter and her class, the York class heavy cruisers. The reason being is I couldn't find a alternative resource to point you towards and so I thought this would be a nice little test example. Um, so, if this is your thing, uh, let me know how you think this is. So, following the Washington Naval Treaty of 1921, where the displacement of cruisers was limited to 10,000 tons and the caliber of cruiser guns was limited to 8 inch guns, this put the Admiralty in an interesting position because the Admiralty didn't really want very few number of powerful cruisers they'd much rather have lots of lighter cruisers the reason being is it's to cover the international trade routes from the empire back to or around the empire as well i guess you could say so the admiralty was never really keen on the idea of heavy cruisers however they reluctantly agreed to produce some cruisers. Now, the following on from their experience of the Hawking class, uh, this is where the county class of cruisers come in. Now, the county class is split up into three subclasses, the Kent, the London, and the Norfolk, and they're the predecessors to the York class. But I think to cover off the York class, we need to cover off this subclass. So the subclass um, were built during the 1920s, um, from 25 to 26. It looks like the commission from 1928 onwards. Now, although these ships did offer a powerful arm and excellent endurance, high speed and a good standard of habitation, uh, these four features were brought at only at the expense of protection, which meant they were very lightly armoured. Now, how lightly armoured, you could say, is based on that the main belt is only 4.5 inches, um, but one inch really closing towards the ends. And the deck armour is only about an inch thick as well, so there's not exactly a lot of armour there. So the, the decks 1.25 to 1.5, the main citadel is 1 to 4 inches and the turrets are only really 1 inch thick so it's only really splinter protection when it comes to the turrets. So they're making a lot of sacrifices in the overall armour and considering this is a heavy cruiser, really those kind of stats, you're not going to be resisting gunfire from higher caliber guns like 8 inch for example now these came in at about a cost of 2 million each which was a little bit on the expensive side for Britain at the time uh, considering economically following the first world war not exactly in an ideal position um, the First World War meant that the entire industry of the United Kingdom had to focus on producing weaponry and machinery and the such for fighting the First World War, which meant that the usual trade that the United Kingdom relied upon, which was exporting machinery, exporting steam engines and that kind of stuff across the world, kind of stopped. We had to stop. We couldn't supply the international market with warships and machinery and high quality goods when we were busy focusing on fighting a war and we needed all of that those resources for ourselves. Which meant that internationally, the world either had to turn to other suppliers or they had to make their own. So that means when the First World War finished and we kind of went, oh, we're open to trade again, um, they kind of moved on and so that market had kind of shrunk and therefore Britain had kind of or well, United Kingdom kind of got itself into a bit of a debt due to having to fight the war 
and then didn't really have the income as well. So you can kind of say there's like a bit of austerity. So two million pounds for a cruiser is a very high unit price at the time. And therefore they started looking at a an alternative design. So the county class cruisers are known as the class A design. Now Draken for now does do a very good review on those and so I have that carded top right now. I I don't really want us to be stepping on people's toes. However, the, the York class hasn't been covered as far as I know. So the changes from the county class to the York class. Uh, displacement was taken, so on the counties was 9,900 tonnes. Uh, this was reduced to 8,400 tonnes. So there's a reduction in displacement. There was also a reduction of length from 630 feet to 515 feet. Uh, that because of this shorter length, what that means is we lose a turret. So on the county classes, you have four dual gun eight inch turrets. On the Exeter, you only have three dual gun eight inch turrets. So there's a reduction in firepower. Furthermore, there was a reduction of what they call bunkerage or fuel storage. Uh, this was reduced from 3,200 tonnes down to 1,900 tonnes. Now for Britain at the time, you can kind of get away with doing that. Thanks to the British Empire, you've got friendly ports and colonies across the world. Places that you can always dock at constantly. So you can kind of get away with reducing the amount of fuel. Now, although fuel was excluded as a, in, within its weight within the Washington Naval Treaty, basically it was a clause we added. Um, when, when you're writing the treaties, you can kind of twist them to your advantage. So the British argued that fuel shouldn't count towards the displacement of a vessel because um, the amount of fuel that you need would be reflected on where you need to go and being that Japanese sphere of interest was specific the American sphere of interest was the Atlantic and Pacific and the British Empire's sphere of interest was global um, the argument was well obviously we wanted to have more fuel on our ships to travel the world and then here what you see is that they're reducing the tonnage of the fuel because by reducing the tonnage of fuel you're reducing the size of the ship. So that's quite an interesting one there. They're actually making a compromise on the fuel even though they probably, because of the area it takes up really. Um, another one is that the uh, number of funnels was reduced. So on the counter class you've got three funnels. And on the York class, they trunked two of the funnels together, reducing the number of funnels from three to two. Now, by trunking funnels together, although, say, three funnels individually, their weight is less, by trunking funnels together, you reduce the actual weight of, the, weight of the funnels in total because you haven't got additional steel work. Almost try and think of it as, like, take two toilet rolls, without the toilet, like two toilet roll tubes. If you cut the two and then stuck them together to make like a big oval, all that cardboard you've cut away is all the weight of steel that you've saved from making these funnels. That's like a nice way to look at it. So, other, so with the Exeter and the York, um, protection again was very light. You're looking at two inches on the horizontal deck to protect to protect against long range plunging fire and two to three inches on the vertical bow over the machinery spaces to protect against short range flat fire. Um, now although originally it was planned to have seven of these B class or York class cruisers um, due to financial cutbacks um, only two of them were actually built. This was HMS York, and then followed into service in 1931 was HMS Exeter. Now, HMS Exeter was the fourth, fourth ship to carry this name, and she was constructed at Devonport Dockyard, so quite fitting, really. Now, on the outbreak of World War II, um, the Exeter was part of the South American Division uh, down around the area of like the Falklands and Argentina, you can, the South Atlantic, I guess you could say. 
Now, at the time, that division consisted of HMS Cumberland, which is a county class cruise, heavy cruiser, and HMS uh, Ajax, which is a Leander class light cruiser. So, only really, like only really, the Cumberland is about the ten thousand displacement mark for the Exeter and the Leander being considerably smaller. Now, this does then lead to one of the outstanding moments of the HMS Exeter's career, in which she engaged against the Graf Spey, not Spee, Spey, um, in the South Atlantic. Now, during this combat, um, HMS Cumberland was refueling at the Falkland Islands, and the South American Division had been recently reinforced with HMNZS Achilles, which was also a Leander class uh, cruiser. So the Exeter and the Ajax and the Achilles uh, basically encountered the Grass Bay. Uh, during the battle, um, Commodore Hardwood uh, split his units into two divisions. So there was a division of Ajax and Achilles, which made up basically the two light cruisers were working together. And then HMS Exeter was separate, uh, basically working as her own division. Now, during the combat, um, Exeter came off the worst. Graf Bay focused on the heavy cruiser, which would make sense, being that she's got the most firepower. During the combat, um, a number of heroic actions were taking place on the HMS Exeter, but one that always stands out to me um, from the book is where the after control officer uh, took charge of Y turret, the only active turret at the time, and he stationed himself on the roof of the turret where he could see better and ignoring the blast and flying splinters shouted spotting corrections down through a manhole. So this man was stood on top of the turret and you got to think that the muzzle blast is only God's just try, well, try and imagine how long the barrel is I guess you could say so it's not really going to be that far and this is massive explosions coming from the two of them all the time HMS Exeter is under fire from the Graf Spey and even if the shells don't hit the ship when they hit the water they're going to detonate and you have shards of metal hot metal flying through the air and he stood on top of this turret exposed spotting where the shells land it's absolutely insane it's just it's one of those things that whenever i read it i always have to pause basically i guess you could say but during this um short combat because it was a very short combat it was a ferocious fight but it was short exeter suffered the following damage a and b turrets were out of action from direct hits remember these turrets only have one inch of armor so a direct hit is probably going to, well, it's basically going to write them off, is the best way to put it. Y turret was still firing local control, with the after control officer stood on the roof. The bridge, DCT and transmitting stations were out of action, so her bridge had basically been hit. A fierce fire was raging in the CPOs and, and flats. So basically that's the sleeping facilities, things like that. Minor fires were burning on the Marines mess deck and in the paint shop. There was no telephone communications. Orders could only be passed by messengers. So following the bridge being hit, Captain Bell retired to the aft bridge. And because all the voice pipes had been shredded due to shrapnel, they had to pass orders to the uh, blow deck steering and uh, speed control by a, by a chain of people. It was like Chinese whispers, but everyone but everyone had to pass the command. 
The ship was down by the bows by about three feet because of flooding forward and had a list from 7 to 10 degrees to the starboard due to 650 tons of water which had flooded in. Only one 4-inch gun could still be fired, that's the secondaries. Both aircraft had been jettisoned. Wireless communications had completely broken down, so basically she had no communication with the outside world. Thankfully the engine room was undamaged and the ship was still steaming at full speed ahead. And the heat was so great that in the furnaces the floors were becoming almost fluid because of the list, the molten brickwork had run over to the starboard side. So the engines are burning so hot it's burning the fire, it's melting the fire bricks at the bottom of the furnace. Now HMS, Ajax, uh, HMS Exeter does survive this combat and she retires to the Falkland Islands for repairs. HMS Ajax and Achilles then shadow the Graf Spey into Montedale Harbour. And I won't go any more into this. Um, I think I carded a video in the Exeter review which did a very good cover of what happened but I'll card that top right now as well. So, after repairs at Port Stanley and the Falcon Islands, the Exeter returned to the United Kingdom for a considerable time in the dockyards for major repairs. So, you can kind of get just how badly she was damaged. Once she was uh, repaired, um, she was then sent out to the Far East where the situation had worsened in a threatening way. Basically, the Japanese are ramping up their introduction into the Second World War. Once in the Far East, and with the Japanese starting their advances across Malaya and Burma um, before reaching the Dutch East Indies, HMS Exeter joined a hodgepodge flotilla, I guess you could say, of Australian, British, Dutch, and American warships also known as the ABDA forces. Um, so by the end of February 1942 had been badly moored as they tried without success to check the Japanese amphibious advances through the islands. February 1942 also notes when Singapore fell and so Java remained the last allied controlled area before Australia and its islands. And so although it wasn't known at the time it was deemed that Australia was the end goal of the Japanese advance. And so this force of five cruisers which included HMS Exeter and ten destroyers sailed to intercept an invasion fleet as it headed towards Java um, to what is known as the Battle of the Java Sea. Now HMS Exeter during this combat took a hit uh, from an 8 inch shell in the boiler room. Um, following this hit she was on fire and her speed was reduced to a mere 5 knots. A HMS Exeter pulled out of line um, due to the damage taken. As the battle continued um, Exeter basically with the rear guard um, she was covered by four destroyers which made smoke as the Exeter turned away. Now the Battle of the Java Sea continued and I think there's a decent video on it and so I'll card that top right now as well. However, um, Exeter was harried by Japanese light cruisers and destroyers um, and HMS Exeter was only really saved due to the defence of the escorting destroyers of which HMS Electra was sunk. And Overnight she was able to make it to the temporary safety of port of Surabaya. Now, the following day, Exeter and her little flotilla uh, broke, uh, left the harbour. Uh, however, they were spotted by a Japanese reconnaissance aircraft. And although by now HMS Exeter was capable of doing 23 knots, um, the Exeter was found and confronted by Japanese forces with four heavy cruisers and four destroyers. So quite an unequal battle to commence. And HMS encounter and USS Pope were the accompanying destroyers and they drove off determined attacks. 
before the Exeter succumbed to gunfire and torpedo hits. She rolled over to starboard and sunk. Two destroyers were later sunk 30 minutes later. So, not a happy end to HMS Exeter. She has a glorious start of the war in 1939. Uh, however, by 1942, she's lost. Well, this has been a test video. Um, if you've enjoyed it, let me know. Do you think... Would you enjoy to see more of these? Or do you think they don't quite have a place in this channel? It'd be interesting to see. Um, I don't think I'll do lots, but it would be interesting to see maybe do like one every now and then if this is interesting. Um, but yeah, I haven't exactly got lots of reading material, um, so I don't have an extensive library or anything to collect this information. I've got a couple of simple books here and there, which are intriguing to use. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have, give it a like or dislike if you haven't enjoyed it. Uh, comment below if any thoughts. Uh, do you think harbour footage in the background is acceptable or would you prefer to see gameplay? But then it's like what kind of gameplay? That's always the big question. And then uh, the other question, the other one is um, if, well, I think that's everything really. Well, I've been the Gamma Pin Major and this has been Back to the Port.